Today we are going to talk about North Korea. North Korea has been hitting the front page lately, uh, blowing up roads to South Korea, dropping garbage using drones into South Korea, launching missiles, sending weapons to Russia, now planning also to send troops to Ukraine as well. And here in the Western media, the narrative has been always uh, the country is run by a ruthless dictator with majority of the population starving. The supreme leader and his family is the only people in the country that gets not, not just well fed, overly fed. Okay. And as soon as you try to maybe say something more balanced towards North Korea, people will immediately jump out and say something like, well, if you like North Korea so much, why don't you leave the United States and go live there for the rest of your life? See how you like it, huh? Uh, I would say that people who talk that way is kind of amateurs when it comes to geopolitics. I think North Korea is one of the least understood countries in the world. And because of that case of demonization by Western media, its reputation around the world is also the most, I would say, distorted at the moment. And I want to use this opportunity, okay, to offer an alternative view of North Korea. Because by reading uh, sometimes in the comment section, when people mention North Korea, I can see there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding, uh, mainly around three things. OK, one is that China and North Korea relationship was often misunderstood. Many people think that North Korea is like a vassal or puppet of China. That's not true. I'll explain why. The second thing is about North Korea's economy and standard of living, which is has been stagnated for decades. What's the reason behind it? Is it really about the supreme leader and his, you know, ungodly ruling of the country? And then third, um, the reason why North Korea uh, made uh, the most recent geopolitical decisions to help Russia. Let's dive in. The Korea and China relationship was relatively good throughout much of the Asian history, characterized by mutual benefit, cultural exchange, and, and political cooperation. There was a short period of war, but majority of the time it is mutual respect and peaceful coexistence. So Korea was never part of the Chinese empire in Asian history. The furthest it went was, I believe, during the Yuan dynasty, which China was conquered and ran by the Mongolian. And Korea at that time became a vassal of the Yuan dynasty and the greater Mongolian Empire. In the 19th and early 20th century, China's influence was significantly weakened in the area due to Western colonial powers activity in the region. And of course, the rise of Imperial Japan. Taiwan was annexed by Japan after the Sino-Japanese War between 1894 and 1895. And then Korea was annexed by Japan later in 1910. The occupation of Korea ended after the surrounding of Japan in 1945. But there was no clear plan for its future governance. Originally, the United States and the Soviet's intention was to divide Korea temporarily for the purpose of disarming Japan and establishing stability. Of course, quickly came the Cold War. With different ideology, the unification became rather difficult. So this is the first part my audience have to understand. Okay, The initial division of Korea has absolutely nothing to do with China. In fact, today's China run by PRC does not even exist back then. Okay, China was still in a civil war and did not became what it is today until 1949. So it is a more correct way to look at both events, the Chinese civil war and the Korean civil war uh, as part of the greater context of Cold War between the Soviet Union and the United States. Now, there are many reasons why Chinese entered the Korean War. 
I don't want to go through all the details, but just put forward a few bullet points. It is both anti-imperialism and also anti-US influence in the region. Again, this anti-imperialism narrative is not commonly portrayed in the West. Uh, Western narratives are usually pro-capitalist, anti-communist. Uh, it's not even pro-democracy back then. The democracy cult didn't come in until later. And I refer to democracy as a, a cult, like a religion today in practice. It's something else, um, but that's a different topic. And then there's this historical reasoning that Korea is always a friend and ally of the Chinese, and it's been manipulated by the evil Americans, imperialists, uh, somewhere along that line, okay? And then there's Chinese own security reason and concern of the Western bloc coming straight next to the Chinese border. However, there's one element that wasn't really mentioned in public. Now you see, China was very underdeveloped at the time. There were small pockets of industry, many in the north, built by the Japanese during the Japanese occupation of northern China, and some other random bits scattered across China. And many of these industries are militarily facing due to all this war that happened over the decades and century. And after World War II and the Civil War, when CPC came to power, China desperately needed foreign assistance to help modernize and industrialize its economy. Well, who can Chinese talk to? Definitely not the Americans, because Americans literally still back the you know KMT in Taiwan. Western Europeans are all evil imperialists, as you know, ideological difference here with China. But do you ask the Soviets? Because Russia has always considered China as a potential threat, it was a very powerful civilization throughout its history, and it's right next to the Russian border, you know, fragile, long Russian southern border, right? So Russian, even after helping, you know, Chairman Mao to win the Civil War, beating the American-backed KMT, it is not in a rush to help China to become powerful again. Because if you think about it, if Chairman Mao's Communist Party can beat back the Americans' arm KMT, how can Russia be sure that, you know, after helping China to get strong, China will not turn on Russia, which China kind of did later on. So Russia's attitude is more like, well, you won the war, Go on then, you know, just do what you want. Good luck, that kind of attitude. So when it comes to the Korean War, there's this hidden Chinese agenda that we, the Chinese, need to impress the Soviet. We need to prove that we are a good ally, uh, a valuable partner to counter and fight off those evil Western imperialists. So China approached the Soviet and basically say that, well, our communist Koreans are losing the war. We need to help them out. I know you do not want to get into a direct conflict with the Americans and the West. Okay, how about this? Uh, we will provide the manpower. Uh, you provide us with the weapons and equipment. We will go in and fight. And the Russians are like, okay, let's do that. So China entering the Korean War is mainly to protect its own security and also to consolidate relationship with the Soviet. So during and after the Korean War, the Soviet provided China and North Korea with advisors in technology and equipment, how to build our industry, especially the heavy industry, okay? Although the total amount of support received by the Chinese were more than that of the North Korean, the focus is, I would say, slightly different. So the North Korean received heavy industrial development from the Soviet aimed towards military industry in anticipation for a future war. However, the support to China uh, was not aimed towards military industry. 
Again, this is obvious because China is a potential strategic rival to Russia and the North Koreans are not. So if you look at it closely, both China and North Korea became part of the Soviet bloc at that time, but maintain a higher degree of political independence compared to, let's say, the Warsaw states. So back then, the relationship among these countries is more like both China and North Korea are attached to the Soviet communist bloc, and China is more loosely attached and North Korea is more strongly attached, okay? After the Sino-Soviet split in 1960s, North Korea tried to rebalance the relationship uh, between China and the Soviet. This is also a time when North Korea started to seek a more independent path away from Chinese and the Soviet influence. Since then, the China-South Korea-Japan relationship has been on average better than that of China-North Korean relationship because China was slowly integrating into the world economy and becoming a US economic satellite. Okay. One more thing, both China and Russia publicly opposed uh, to North Korea's nuclear weapon program. The Soviet during the early Cold War era provided great assistance to North Korea in constructing its nuclear power plant and training its scientists and engineers. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia greatly reduced technological support to North Korea, starting from Boris Yeltsin and his US-leaning policy. So that said, in the history of modern-day China since CPC took over, North Korea has never been the kind of Chinese satellite that people in the West thought it is. It's better to refer to maybe as a Eastern Front of the Warsaw State. Now, the second misunderstanding is regarding North Korea's economic struggle. Mm, the general accepted narrative is that North Korea is self-isolated and hostile. It is run by ruthless dictator who don't care about its own people. First, you can't blame North Korea during the Soviet era, right? Um, because it belonged to the Soviet camp, just like all the other Warsaw states. It might not have a realistic way to detach itself from the Soviet influence, because if you think about it, the Kim family, if they did not get the support of the Soviet, they might not have survived, and Soviet might have ended up backing some other uh, North Korean family at that point. So we should be sympathetic to North Korea during that era the same way we should be sympathetic towards many of the Warsaw states as well who didn't do that well economically during the Cold War era. Now, after the collapse of the Soviet Union is what gets interesting, okay? North Korea didn't integrate with the West. I think it tried to at some point. This is where things get a little bit twisted, okay? You have to really understand the US global geopolitical strategy. And it has been like this for a long time, not just since Cold War, but it is a, I would almost say that it's a colonial power projection strategy. In order to justify its military intervention in the region, uh, the United States has to often establish some kind of a threat some kind of an enemy evil in that region okay there's a cartel or there's a religious extremist there's terrorists uh there's you know isis and all this kind of thing so after the cold war in order to justify the united states continued military deployment in the area and also area around the world which is beneficial not just to the military industrial complex of the United States, but also allow US to passively and if not aggressively intervene in local politics to position countries in a way that favors the United States. So I would say that North Korea after the collapse of the Soviet Union and China becoming a US economic satellite has to remain according to United States, has to remain as a boogeyman 
of the East in order to justify its military control over Japan and South Korea. And there are people who are deep into geopolitics from Japan and South Korea knows that US influence over their foreign policy and also economic decision is very severe. I will get to that in my future video, uh, especially the assassinations uh, to keep those two countries in line. Conspiracy theories. Let's see how you guys take it. So basically to summarize, North Korea is more valuable to the United States as an enemy and a boogeyman in the region than anything else. So the sanction and isolation continue. So with that, the United States can actually get more weapon sales into those countries and get more public support. And also that they can station the troops there and continue to kind of influence the local politics. Okay. And this is also the reason why United States do not like the deal between Saudi Arabia and Iran broken by Chinese because United States need those countries to stay hostile to each other. Just like United States need Europe to stay hostile to Russia. And also right now, United States need Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, many countries to stay hostile to China. They also want you know, Southeast Asia to stay hostile to China. That's the US you know, global strategy in a nutshell. So whenever you want to look at North Korea, you should also compare it to countries like um, Cuba or Venezuela. Cuba is still under blockade today uh, to serve as a warning to the rest of Latin America that the Monroe Doctrine is real. Don't mess with the United States. In addition, you also have to remember that North Korea is a highly populated country uh, with limited natural resources. So without industrialization and freedom to trade with the rest of the world, it will remain poor and difficult to feed its uh, population. The same can be said to also other East Asian countries, Japan, South Korea, China, all these countries are not really self-sufficient in terms of food. They require import. And in this particular case, North Korea cannot really trade with the rest of the world because it's getting blockaded by the United States. There are, of course, internal reasons as well. But if North Korea is allowed to interact with the rest of the world um, without US blockading and demonizing it all the time, it might do much better than majority of the global South country, I would say. Consider Koreans are very hardworking and very smart people. And North Korea are basically the same people as South Korean. Which brings us to the final question of today. Why is North Korea helping Russia in Ukraine? Well, because there's really no other viable option, as I said. After the Soviet Union collapse, North Korea was basically abandoned by both China and Russia. Uh, China was busy minding its own business and does not want to muddle in milky water, knowing what North Korea is to United States. You know, United States need a boogeyman in the area. And if it's not North Korea, United States might turn its sight on China. So China understand that and just kind of ignore it. Russia, at the same time, were completely in a mess. So they have no interest and capability to help North Korea. So North Korea was basically abandoned for three decades, more or less, and cut off from the rest of the world. Isolated, just like Cuba, I will say. Very unfortunate. And now North Korea see that this is a chance to win back favor from the Russians to help Russia in this war. This will give North Korea more bargaining power to receive more economic and technical support from Russia in the future. Now, remember what I said at the beginning of this video? This is exactly what China did during the Korean War, right? To win favor of the Soviet, to get assistance in economic development. This is exactly what North Korea is doing right now. <laughs> However, that being said, though, I believe U.S. position might change a bit as well. Back then, Russia and China are both kind of integrating into the West, into the U.S. unipolar world, right? Now, both Russia and China are back being the bogeyman. U.S. might be more intended to work with North Korea, if not 
you know, straight off regime change North Korea to get them to fight Russia and China as a proxy. I think that could be a strategy, but I do not think the Kim family will bite on that narrative. So I think US will probably lean on going for like a full regime change operation. To add another thing, South Korea and North Korea actually worked towards improving their relationship over the years. But again, US went very far to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, it's the same story in the whole region, if not the entire world, basically in Middle East, in Europe, in Asia. It's the same thing, you know, divide and rule tactic. Oh, I found a short video showing that how US maintain its allies around the world. That's such a perfect description, right? <laughs> now, over the past few weeks, I've been talking to my audience, some of my audience in my private email section. And I expressed to them that this US unipolar world structure is not entirely bad. There are silver lining to it. And the United States could have done something that better manage it to make it last longer, but now it's kind of too late and we are destined to change. And I just hope that whatever came after is better than where we are leaving right now. Let me know what you guys think and thanks for watching. Please press the like button and I'll see you guys in the next video.